Hello and welcome. Thank you for participating in Moorhead at Home Skywatching, hosted by Moorhead Planetarium and Science Center. My name is Amy Sale. I'm an educator at Moorhead. We are a unit of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, located on campus. We also work throughout the state through a number of outreach initiatives like our summer camp programs, mobile lab bands, and the annual North Carolina Science Festival. Our mission is to help people better understand science, technology, and health, and we do this through engaging learning opportunities like this live virtual event. We're happy to have you here with us today, and uh, Nick will tell us more. Hey, thanks, Amy. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to Moorhead at Home Skywatching. We're really excited to have you. Uh, my name's Nick Eeks. I'm also an educator at Moorhead, uh, and we have one of our very favorite topics for you today. So. Um, I hope you got some good stargazing in over your Labor Day weekend. Um, and uh, our goal today is to dive into some stories that have been around for a long time. Uh, we're going to be talking about Greek myths in our nighttime sky. Um, so uh, there's tons of stories that we could tie together, but we picked a couple of our favorites for you. Um, and what we'll try to do is show you where some of this cast of characters actually reside where their constellations reside uh, up in the sky above us. Um, so the first things first, I'm going to get us oriented to Stellarium. Um, I think we'll put in the chat the um, link to find that uh, if you ever wanted to download the program on your own. It's really cool, free, open source, kind of like flat screen planetarium software. Um, and we love to use it and we'd love for y'all to be able to try it out too. Um, and that's what we're going to be using to show you the constellations today. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, so that you can uh, get a look um, at our sky. Now, this might kind of be what your sky looks like if you were to walk outside right now, but I know that it probably looks sort of distorted to us. So let me uh, show you around a little bit here. Um, this is the sky from somewhere like Chapel Hill, North Carolina. So somewhere at this latitude and this altitude from right now. And I know it's right now because we have a clock down here that tells us it's the 8th of September. I kind of can't believe that. And it's a little after 10 a.m. Another couple important things. You might see a blue sky and green grass. Well, that line that separates the sky from the ground is called the horizon. And along our horizon today, you might even see some big red letters. Now, those are super important because we are going to be getting a couple of different viewpoints throughout the program today. And right now we're facing towards this big letter S. You probably know that stands for South. So right now on our right, W for West. On our left, E for East. And North, it, you can imagine it's kind of behind us right now. Um, so again, I'm gonna move the view around, but kind of track which of those big red letters is towards the bottom of your screen, because that gives you an indication of which way you would need to be facing outside to really see this view. Um, one other thing, I notice a couple of objects that are already up in the sky. Even though it's the daytime, you can still see a couple of things. Um, Amy, I didn't know if you saw those as well. I do. I see if you all look at your screen towards the right, you'll see an object that's labeled uh, the moon. And in fact, the moon is in your sky right now. So as soon as we're done with this program, if you pop outside, you may see that it's the waning gibbous moon. It will be setting in the west. Um, you may have to move around a little bit if there's trees blocking your view, but uh, after you're done today, if it's clear where you are, uh, take a look. Also, I see a really bright object next <laughs> that can only be our daytime star, the sun. Um, looks like it's over there in the east, maybe east, southeast. And um, as the day goes on, the sun will appear to move across the sky because we live on a spinning planet Earth and that makes the sky appear to turn around us. So we're gonna have a question for you all, get ready. We're about to ask you a question. Um, I want you to think about what path the sun will take during the sky today and specifically what direction will the sun set? Um, pick the best answer of the choices you're given. So what direction does the sun set? Where will it disappear below the horizon? Um, north? South, east, west. So go ahead and put your best, your best guess. Don't sweat it if you don't happen to know the answer. Uh, we will tell you. Go ahead and put your guess in. And then um, while we're waiting for you all to uh, put your guesses in, maybe Nick, could we go ahead and do a little speeding up of time? Yeah, absolutely. Let's do it. 
Um, in the real world, you have to wait for every second to go by. Uh, but here in Stellarium, you can you can just move time along. You notice our clock is speeding up, but I hope you also notice that it looks like the sun is moving across the sky. Let's move this out of the way. Oh, okay, and let's see. And we got the answers. So uh, most of y'all said the sun is gonna set in the west. That is correct. I see we got uh, some votes for east. Uh, you were probably thinking of the sunrise direction. So the sun rises more or less in the east, that's more or less in the west, and that is because Earth is spinning uh, the opposite direction from west to east, and that gives us the illusion that the sky moves around us. So most everything in the sky, uh, not just the sun, but the nighttime stars, planets, moon, rise more or less in the east and set more or less in the west. There's a little bit of a weird thing that goes on in the north, and we will get to that um, at the end of the second story. Yeah. Okay, so Nick, what are, what are you taking us to here? What time? So I moved us to about 9 p.m. I know that's getting close to bedtime for some of us, but um, for us here in North Carolina tonight, um, that, that's when it's going to get nice and dark. It's about an hour and a half after the sunset. Um, so there's a couple of things that probably pop out to you that I'll mention before we dive into our story and start moving around a little bit. And, and those are very likely the planets. One reason is because they're labeled here in Stellarium, but another reason is probably they're very bright. So Jupiter and Saturn are both gonna be visible this evening. Um, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure that you will notice them as long as it's not super duper cloudy and, and you have a view towards the south, uh, but they're gonna be shining steadily um, and they're gonna be quite bright. I will say I saw Jupiter and Saturn this weekend and Jupiter was significantly brighter than Saturn. So that'll be the brighter of the two. And it's kind of appropriate because Jupiter is named um, for the, the Roman god, Jupiter, who's identified with the Greek god Zeus, who's supposed to be the king of the Greek god. So it seems kind of appropriate that, that this planet looks so bright to us. Um, so the story that I have for you involves Zeus, AKA Jupiter, uh, also involves the sun, which is already set below the horizon now, and, uh, and involves a teenage boy who bragged a little bit too much one day. So this is how it goes. Um, let me just say, uh, before we start, there are lots of different versions and variants of these stories. So you may know the version I'm gonna tell you, or you may know a slightly different version, and that's okay. Okay, so this is called Phaethon's Last Ride, and this is how it goes. Phaethon was a teenage boy who was talking with his friends one day, and they were all kind of bragging to each other. Phaethon really had something to brag about. His father was no ordinary mortal. His father was Helios, the sun god. And Phaethon bragged to his friends, Helios is so important. His job is to drive the sun chariot across the sky every day from the east to the west. He has to control four fiery horses. And this the horses are so hard to control that not even Zeus, the king of the gods, can handle this job. Only my father, Helios, can do it properly. Well, his friends didn't really believe this. And so they say, say your father is a god, you need to prove it. So Phaethon went to his mother, but she could offer no proof. She just said, you'll have to go to Helios directly and ask him. So Phaethon journeyed out to the palace where Helios lived. And when he approached the throne, he had to shield his eyes because Helios was so bright from the light of the sun. And Helios immediately greeted Phaethon and said, Phaethon, my son, I'm so happy to see you. What brings you here? And Phaethon, Phaethon said, Helios, take away this uncertainty in my heart. Please prove to me that I am truly sprung from you, that you are truly my father. And Helios said, of course. And to prove it to you, I offer you any promise, anything you ask of me, it is yours. And that will be the proof. Well, Phaethon thought about this and being a bit of an impulsive teenage boy, he didn't think through his choice very carefully. And he said, father, what I really want is to drive the sun chariot across the sky for just one day. And Helios realized he had made a terrible mistake. No, Phaethon, only I can control the four fiery horses. Not even Zeus himself can do it. Anything you should ask of me, anything else, please. And Phaethon, he was stubborn and he said, you promised. So with a heavy heart, Helios led out Phaethon to the stables where the horses were kept and he smeared some protective ointment on his son's face to protect him from the light and heat of the sun. And the first ominous sign was when Phaethon leapt onto the chariot 
and the horses didn't even register his weight. But dawn was breaking, the sky was turning red in the east, and the stable doors burst open, and the horses leapt out into the sky. Phaethon tried really hard to pull on their reins, but they were totally uncontrollable, and they immediately went off the proper path, and Phaethon became a menace on the celestial highway. First, he veered down way to the south, and he could see that there was an archer swinging its arrow in his direction. He was so scared and he tried to get, get the horses to move a little bit. And then he could see a scorpion getting ready to sting them. And then the horses galloped way to the north where the icy polar dragon Draco was inflamed with fury to see the sun coming its way. And so then the chariot swung around more and the horses got really close to the polar bears, Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, and they tried in vain to immerse their hot paws into the, the waters of the ocean. The sun chariot and the horses, all of it was totally out of control. They veered way too close to earth, setting it on fire, then way up high in the heavens and Phaethon looked down and he was so scared to see the earth burning below him. Mother Nature herself, cried out to Zeus to do something. And so Zeus thundered in his fury and he tossed one of his thunderbolts at the sun chariot and Phaethon fell out and tumbled to the ground just like a shooting star. And he landed in the waters of the river Aridinus, dead. But he had a faithful friend, Sickness, who dove into the water repeatedly to gather all the charred bones of his friend Phaethon and he gave Phaethon a proper burial. And then Zeus performed a miracle. Because of Phaethon's friend's loyalty to him, Zeus took this friend, took his nose and elongated it into a beak and feathers began to sprout over his arms, which turned into wings. And Phaethon's friend Cygnus became the constellation Cygnus, the swan. And if you look closely where Cygnus just appeared in the sky, you'll see that he looks like he's flying down this kind of white hazy band that maybe represents the scorched path of Phaethon's disastrous ride. Okay, and Nick is showing you with the cursor, um, he was showing you that kind of hazy path across the sky. And many of you may know that, first of all, that is not the proper path of the sun. The sun should move across the sky more or less from the east to the west every day. And that is not what just happened. Um, so Phaethon was very much off course. Also, that's actually the Milky Way. The Milky Way is not made of milk. It's made of stars. So that is a path of starlight that you see. There's more stars in that part of the sky and that's why it looks brighter in that hazy band. So that's the epilogue for that story is that's how the Milky Way came to be according to that Greek myth. And uh, Nick, can you tell us, um, I noticed the sky moved around a little bit. What direction are we now? Looking. Yeah, that's that's a really good point, and I love that story. Um, I think it's a great cautionary tale <laughs> in many ways. Um, we did move though, right at the beginning uh, of Amy's story. We swung around to face the west southwest, so our original view was more something like this towards the south. And you see why we couldn't really catch Draco and those polar bears if we were looking towards the south. So a lot of times to get a full view of these stories, you do have to kind of move around a bit. Um, and that is what we're going to do now as well. Um, we're going to move forward in time and stay up a little bit later so that we can find the, the cast of characters for our next story. Um, this next slate of characters, oftentimes we call them fall or autumn constellations. Um, we're not officially into fall yet. I know we're probably wishing for that, many of us, uh, temperature-wise. Um, but as we move deeper into the summer, um, we get a look at these constellations earlier in the evening. So we're, we're going to move later all the way to about midnight. Um, and then I'm going to change your view again. And I see, Nick, a planet just popped up in the east. Remember that things more or less rise in the east because of the Earth's rotation? Oh, and something else. Do y'all see something else that popped up in the east? The yeah, moon. Let's just move over here because both of those things are very interesting. We're going to get an Eastern view now. I know that we're spinning you all over the place today, but um, I think those things that Amy mentioned are Mars and Moon. 
Um, so tonight, uh, those are well placed near some of these um, constellations that we're getting ready to uh, involve in our story. Um, but again, this is about midnight. So if you want to catch the moon and Mars this evening, Mars rises a little earlier than midnight if you have a view of that eastern horizon. Uh, but it looks like the moon comes up just before midnight tonight. Yeah, Mars is currently rising about 9.30 p.m. And if that's too late for you, well, it's rising earlier and earlier each night. Um, and then Nick, we should probably mention if people have questions, how should they submit their questions? That is a really good point. I know I forgot to say it right at the beginning. Um, there is a Q&A function on, on Zoom because I know you might have questions about um, the specific stories or what's going on in the sky. Feel free to use the Q&A, type in your question there. And uh, at the end, we are gonna take a little bit of time to try to answer any of your questions. Um, so hopefully some of us figured it out. I can tell a couple of people have already put questions in there. Um, but that's the best way to ask us something today. Okay, and so um, Nick, I'm super excited because this next story, I think it's my favorite of the Greek myths because it ties together so many different um, characters and constellations that you can see either if you're willing to stay up really late in summer or these constellations will rise earlier if it's more into the fall because they're mostly associated with the fall season. Um, and again, um, First of all, Greeks are not the only ones who told stories about the sky. There are stories from all different cultures um, that are represented in the sky. This particular story, there are a lot of different versions of it. So you may not be familiar with the version I'm gonna tell you unless you've heard me tell it before. Um, and this is a famous story of Perseus, Andromeda, and Medusa. Okay, are we ready? You ready, Nick? I'm ready. Okay. So here's how it goes. Our story starts out on the island of Seraphos. Perseus, our hero of the story, lived on Seraphos with his mother, Danae. Now the king of this island was madly in love with Perseus's mother, Danae, but she didn't want to have anything to do with him. She didn't like him at all. So the king was becoming quite a pest. Um, always bothering Danae, trying to get her to marry him. And Perseus was having to spend a lot of time kind of defending his mother from the king until the king came up with a crafty idea. He decided he would get rid of Perseus and he would do this by requiring that Perseus bring him the head of Medusa. Medusa, she was a gorgon. She was a hybrid of a bird and a woman. She had wings and feet like a raptor's. She had nails of bronze, protruding tongue, hair that consisted of tangles of hissing serpents. And really there's only one thing you need to know about Medusa. Nick, what happens if you look at Medusa? Well, I've never done it, but I hear you turn to stone. Yes. Definitely don't ever look at Medusa or you will be turned to stone. So Perseus thought, how is he going to pull this off? He's supposed to bring her head back and he can't look at her. So fortunately, he managed to get some things to help him out. Uh, if you look closely at his picture, you might see that he has winged sandals that he would be able to use to fly to the land where she lived. He got a magical helmet that you can see him wearing that would turn him invisible. He got a magical sickle to cut her head off with, a magical bag to put it in, and maybe you can spot in the sky his magical shield that he would use to look only at her reflected image. It was a mirrored shield. So that's equipped. Perseus, had, Perseus headed off to the land where Medusa lived, and when he arrived, it was at the end of a forest path. And as he walked down the path, at first, everything was normal. The forest was green, it was humming with life. But as he continued to walk, things got a little strange. The green of the plants turned into marble gray. And the forest became silent, as if it had been petrified by a spell. So Perseus was getting a little worried. He knew he must be getting close and he rounded a bend in the path and he saw something truly disturbing. In front of him, arrayed across the path, were statues, statues of human beings. And they were in odd positions. Some of them had hands flung over their eyes like they were trying to shield themselves from some terrible view. Others had their mouths open wide in silent screams. They had all been turned to stone. 
So Perseus figured he was probably pretty close. He put on his helmet to make himself invisible. He checked his magical sickle and his magical bag, and he started walking backwards, looking only in his magical mirror shield. And he spotted it in the shield, an image of Medusa. He walked closer as silently as he could. And as he walked closer to her, he could see the image getting bigger and brighter and he could see her face and he could see the hissing serpents on her head. And once he was close enough that he could actually hear the hissing, he reached back with his magical sickle and thwack, cut her head off. Well, to his great surprise, out of Medusa's body jumped the winged horse Pegasus. But Perseus didn't hang around to contemplate that really weird development in this version of the story. Instead, he took the head of Medusa and quickly stuffed it in that magical bag so he wouldn't risk seeing it by mistake. And then he took off to go back home to Seraphos because he wanted to help his mother out with the king's situation. But on the way, he saw a situation unfolding. Chained to the rocks of the seashore was a young woman, Andromeda. She was a lovely princess. Now what had happened here was all her mother's fault. Her mother was Queen Cassiopeia. If you look closely at her picture, you'll see that she's holding something in front of her face. It's a mirror. Cassiopeia is forever admiring her great beauty. She was a very beautiful woman. One day Cassiopeia was walking along the seashore admiring her beauty and she had the audacity to brag out loud that she was so beautiful, she was more beautiful than the sea nymphs. Oh, they did not like that. The sea nymphs were renowned for their exquisite beauty. So they complained to their father, the god of the seas, Poseidon, and he sent a terrible sea monster, Cetus, to ravage the shores of Cassiopeia's kingdom. And Cetus would get hungry, she'd leap out of the waves and she'd gobble up anybody who was walking by. She gobbled up people, she gobbled up farm animals, she devastated the ships, the harbors, the cities. It was a very big problem. So King Cepheus, Cassiopeia's husband, consulted an oracle to find out what to do. And the answer he got back was, you have one choice. If you want to save your kingdom from the sea monster, you are going to have to sacrifice your daughter, the Princess Andromeda, to the sea monster. Well, Cepheus, of course, didn't want to do this, but he felt he had no choice. His duty to his kingdom, he felt, was even greater than his duty to his own daughter. And so Andromeda was led out to the seashore, chained up. She was wearing diamonds and her long black hair. She had emeralds on her wrists, rubies around her ankles, and she was left there for the sea monster. Well, this was when Perseus entered the scene. He astutely observed the situation unfolding in front of him, and he made several good observations. Number one, there was a young woman chained to the rocks of the seashore. Number two, she was very beautiful, because Andromeda had taken after her mother in terms of looks. Number three, she was wearing a lot of really expensive jewelry. And Perseus, he decided he was in love. He was apparently kind of shallow. So he flew over to Cassiopeia and Cepheus and said, I'll make you a deal. Give me your daughter's hand in marriage. I'll take care of the sea monster. Well, that sounded like a great idea to them. Never mind that Andromeda was actually supposed to marry this other guy. That seemed okay now. So Perseus flew over to Andromeda and his first words to her were to yell at her, shut your eyes, because Cetus had gotten hungry again and was leaping out of the waves at both of them jaws wide open. But Perseus was ready. He grabbed that bag with Medusa's head, whipped it out of the bag, showed it to Cetus, who instantly turned to stone and sank. And then Perseus and Andromeda were free to get married in a wonderful wedding celebration that did have one slight problem. Actually, it was a big problem. That ex-fiance, that guy that Andromeda was supposed to marry, he showed up to the wedding and he brought his big mean friends with him and they brought weapons and they surrounded Perseus and things were looking very grim until Perseus remembered he had taken to carrying the head of Medusa with him everywhere. So he ju just asked all the legitimate wedding guests to please turn their backs for a moment, whipped out the head of Medusa, showed it to his enemies, who instantly turned to stone and fell over. 
And then he and Andromeda flew back towards Seraphos, where he was so relieved to see that his mother, Danae, was okay, and the king was busy holding a big drunken banquet. Perseus triumphantly entered the banquet hall, and the king called out to him, Perseus, have you brought me the head of Medusa? The king was thinking, no way had Perseus pulled this off. And Perseus held up that magical bag and said to the king, why, yes, I have. And he showed them, the he them all the head of Medusa, and the king and all the noblemen turned to stone. The end on that part of the adventure. Um, but there are, there are a couple of epilogues to this story, um, and I'd like to share one with you in particular. It involves the constellation Cassiopeia. And Nick, I wonder if we could swing to the north and that will better illustrate this epilogue. Now we're gonna give you a northern view. Keep your eye on Queen Cassiopeia. She's the one holding the mirror. And um, I'm gonna ask, a, we're gonna pose a question to you all. And I will admit this question is tricky. So don't worry if you don't know the answer. Um, we'll tell it to you, but give us your best guess. So the question is, when does Cassiopeia completely disappear below the horizon for North Carolina viewers. So early we talked about um, how Earth is turning, Earth is rotating from west to east and how that makes things appear to rise in the east and set in the west. Then I mentioned there's something a little more complicated that goes on in the north. Okay, so we're gonna go over that in a second, but give us your guess, best guess first. When does Cassiopeia completely disappear below the horizon for North Carolina viewers? You have three choices. Is it during the spring? Is it very late at night? or is it never? Give us your best guess. And I think Nick is maybe trying to give you all a hint. It's gonna start moving. What we're doing is we're moving through time and we'll, we'll keep you up into the daytime if we have to. And so if you look closely, you'll see that things are rising in the east, just like we said, they're setting in the west. You see Pegasus is starting to dive down towards the west. But keep an eye on Cassiopeia. See if she ever disappears. Does she ever truly set below the horizon? for North Carolina's latitude. And it turns out she won't because there's a pivot point in the sky, which is difficult to see now where it is, but it's marked by the North Star. And um, that star stays more or less in the same position and everything in the North around it gets higher, gets lower, but never truly sets below the horizon. So Cassiopeia, she's in a bad situation right now. If you look at your screen, she's upside down, clinging for her life, robes around her ears. Very embarrassing for a queen to be in this position. That's her further punishment for her vanity about her beauty, is that half the time she's upright on her throne, very dignified, the other half the time upside down, clinging for her life. Okay, and then let's see what you said. So a lot of you got it. In fact, she never disappears below the horizon. Um, and then the rest of you made some great guesses. Because most constellations, there are seasons that they're, they're really only seen in those seasons. Um, like for much of the summer, if you were trying to see Orion, you were out of luck. And it didn't matter where you went on the globe, you weren't going to see Orion. Because it's, it's really a winter constellation. Cassiopeia, though, she's what's called a circumpolar constellation. She's in the north. And uh, that means she's always going to be in the sky for particular latitudes. And that includes the latitude that North Carolina is at, as well as the latitude of the people who originally told this story. And this story, by the way, predates uh, the Greeks. OK, thank you, Nick, for all that hard work <laughs> manipulating Stellarium. Thank you for the wonderful stories. Um... Uh, that again is one, is one of my favorites. And, and I did point out here, um, once it got dark again, we have, you know, transferred ourselves all the way to another night. Uh, this is that pivot point, Polaris or the North Star that Amy mentioned. And you notice that it's kind of like Cassiopeia points to it. But if we were to go through a whole other day, you would see that circumpolar motion. And those are just two stories. Our entire sky is filled with myths and legends. So I think these are the best reality TV soap operas you could imagine. If you run out of things on Netflix to watch, um, go outside and look up because these stories are, are deep and tied into our culture even today, um, even though they come from long ago. So um, hopefully you all enjoyed our stories. Amy is the finest storyteller I know. And uh, I know we only have a couple minutes left, Amy. So do, would you like to look at uh, some questions from our friends here? And I know we have this one last question for them. Yeah, if you all can let, 
let us know how many people are watching this program on your screen. It helps us um, collect some data about how many people total are watching. So if it's just you, indicate that. But if there's more than one of you watching, definitely let us know. And then Nick, do you see, I, I know there's a question I want to answer. Do you see one that you want to take? Um, sure, yeah. I, I see a question about why is Mars orange? Yeah, it kind of looks orange. Um, and I think Joshua asked that question. Um, some folks even say, along with looking orange, it kind of looks red. Um, and when we think of red, a lot of the time we think of really hot things. So I think sometimes we're like, maybe Mars looks red because it's hot, but that is not true. Mars is actually, actually tends to be even colder than our Earth. The reason why Mars looks red or orange is because of what's happening in its soil. Mars is a terrestrial planet, which means it has a solid surface, kind of like our Earth, but it has special chemicals in its soil that make it really, really appear red. And, and that chemical is called iron oxide. And you see that here on Earth as well. You don't have to go to Mars to find iron oxide. Um, we know it here on Earth as rust. So if something is rusty, you know it gets that kind of orangish, brownish, red color. Um, that happens here on Earth for a number of reasons, but it turns out that Mars had a, has a lot of that rusty stuff in its soil. Um, if you're in North Carolina and you dig down into your yard, you probably find this stuff called red clay. It has iron oxide in it as well. Um, so that's a long answer for, for your very good question. The reason why Mars looks orange or red to us is because when the sunlight hits it, it bounces off that surface, which is red, um, and that's how we, how we see the planet. Thank you, Nick. And um, there's a, a question. Um, somebody writes, I love sky stories. Where can I find more? Great question. Um, so what I would recommend is ask a librarian. So if you are a student, you may have a library at your school and a library might be available to answer your question. Um, also, you probably have a public library somewhere near you. I know Nick and I are both huge fans of our local public library, the Chapel Hill Public Library. And even though our library is not yet open for going inside, we're still able to check out books curbside. And there are people available on the phone, um, librarians who would love to help you find um, stories that would be of interest to you. And just as a reminder, Again, there's not just Greek myths being played out over our heads every night. People all around the world from many different cultures have told stories about the sky. So definitely talk to a librarian to help you find more. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we love the library and, um, you know, hopefully uh, you can check out some books about myths. I think that'd be really fun. Okay, well, I love talking about this stuff, Amy, but it looks like our time is almost up. Um, we will be back with y'all next Tuesday at 10 a.m. But if you're interested in finding more resources about astronomy or sky stories, please visit our website at www.moreheadplanetarium.org. Um, also, we're on all sorts of social media, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or YouTube. Um, all of these Moorhead at Home sky watching sessions are recorded and posted on YouTube. Um, you can go watch them for free um, and check them out and maybe revisit a topic uh, that we, we looked at a few weeks ago or something like that. But um, all of this is at your fingertips. So we hope you uh, take advantage of that. We hope you look up at your sky this week. Hopefully we get some nice cool weather and those bugs stay away and you can get some good stargazing in. Um, but otherwise, I think that's it for us. So have a great rest of your day. We'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. See you next Tuesday.